Jim Ottery was a Wisconsin farm boy who disliked cows. So once he graduated from high school, he joined the Navy. That's how he ended up in the Pacific Ocean, in the middle of a war, on a vessel built in a Pittsburgh shipyard. His ship is named LST-750. She's a Navy vessel, paid for and built by the people of Allegheny County. And she's part of a large convoy of ships sent to resupply Allied troops on the island of Mindoro in the Philippines. The year is 1944. The time, just past 10 a.m. on December 28th. Japanese airplanes have been spotted on radar, so sailors and merchant marines in the convoy are on edge. Suddenly, enemy planes appear overhead. They attack. Ottery is manning an anti-aircraft gun in the bow of his ship. One plane in particular catches his attention, perhaps because the pilot is a bit more daring and reckless. Ottery is experiencing his first kamikaze attack. The plane bears down on a Liberty ship called the SS John Burke. The ship is near the center of the convoy. It is so loaded with ammunition and supplies that it sets low in the water. The plane passes through a barrage of gunfire, then slams into its target. The blast is cataclysmic. A shockwave rocks the entire convoy. Soldiers on Mindoro are knocked to the ground. On LST-750, Jim Ottery is blown from his gun turret. He lands on a fellow sailor, breaking that sailor's ribs. Shrapnel tears through a number of ships, including LST-750, leaving jagged openings the size of portholes. The SS John Burke is gone. This is the beginning of what will become a very bad day for Ottery and for all others on LST-750, a ship that was the pride of Pittsburgh. This is what Neville Island looked like six months earlier, on Memorial Day of 1944. 25,000 people lined the riverbank just outside of Pittsburgh to watch LST-750 slide into the Ohio River. Temperatures that day rose into the 90s, and more than 150 people were overcome by heat. LST stands for Landing Ship Tank, the ships were designed to unload vehicles and troops onto enemy beaches. Soon, they would perform crucial roles in the landings at Normandy on D-Day and during the invasion of Okinawa. But early in the war, the Allies had a problem. Coastal shipyards were busy making larger ships of war. So the task of making LSTs fell to a few inland shipyards. Dravo Corporation on Neville Island was chosen by the Navy to lead the effort. LSTs were built in Ambridge, too, and in Evansville, Indiana, and Seneca, Illinois. On Neville Island, Dravo built a new yard and hired thousands of workers. Mostly, the company needed welders. For the first time, women and African Americans were hired. Three of the new workers were Pittsburgh sisters Vera, Ann, and Julie Jerjevic. They earned $30 a week, a lot of money for a young lady in the early 1940s. But the work was difficult. In winter, ice and snow often covered the steel decks. In summer, workers cooked inside leather overalls needed to protect them from sparks. March forward, Americans! But it was a time of great patriotism. The nation was at war. No one knew what the future held. Would Hitler prevail? Would Japan rule the Pacific and occupy the West Coast? Nothing seemed certain. So the Jerjevic sisters and millions of others went to work. Throughout the Pittsburgh region, steel workers and metal fabricators and welders pulled extra shifts. Pittsburgh muscle and machinery produced an astounding amount of war material. On Neville Island, an LST was turned out on average every six days. LST-750 was produced during the island's hot ship period in preparation for D-Day. One boat was launched every three and a half days. LST-750 was special. 
Thousands of Pittsburghers pitched in to buy $5 million in extra war bonds to pay for the ship. She was sponsored by Vera Hines, known today as a founder of the Hines Endowments. Unlike many of her sister ships, LST-750 was not bound for Normandy. She was instead sent to the Pacific Theater. The ship and its crew of 109 hands took part in the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Then, in late December, LST-750 joined a convoy of 100 ships to supply troops who had taken the island of Mindoro. U.S. troops there were setting up airfields and bases. Normally, the convoy would be defended by U.S. warplanes, but bad weather at airfields in Leyte had grounded the planes. The convoy was on its own. After the initial air attack that destroyed the SS John Burke, Japanese aircraft sightings kept sailors on alert. As sundown neared, groups of Japanese torpedo bombers and fighters appeared overhead. Jim Ottery and other gunners sent up a barrage of anti-aircraft fire. One enemy plane, however, launched a torpedo that found its mark. It hit LST-750 on her port side. Fires broke out and the ship began taking on water. Crew members tried to control the damage, but the efforts were hampered because several sailors were still manning guns and fighting off Japanese aircraft. Eventually, darkness brought the attack to an end. One hour after being hit, LST-750 was in danger of capsizing. Her cargo had shifted and the starboard prop was lifting out of the water. Crew members were ordered to abandon ship. Ottery jumped into the water and promptly lost his shoes. Soon he was rescued. Fellow sailors tried to find him a new pair of shoes. They could locate none big enough to fit the young man's feet so they fashioned some makeshift shoes from burlap. LST-750 was scuttled. It took 150 rounds of 5-inch shells from the destroyer Edwards to send LST-750 to the bottom. Like many of those who built her, and like those who served on her, she was young and she was tough. 